Over the next couple minutes, we'll review the existing literature on the optimal time to initiate VTE chemoprophylaxis after solid organ injury. And really, we'll spend the bulk of this talk looking at sort of gaps in the existing data and the, uh, the next steps in the investigation of this topic so that we can land on a practical clinical approach. By way of background, as you know, venous thromboembolic events, or VTEs, are comprised of deep vein thromboses and pulmonary emboli. They're quite common after trauma, especially without early initiation of VTE prophylaxis. And in addition to these concerns about VTEs, trauma patients are also at risk for ongoing bleeding. So especially in high-risk injuries, it can be quite a fine line to sort of walk between initiating prophylaxis early, but also avoiding the provocation of bleeding. And when we talk about abdominal solid organs, we mean specifically the liver, the kidneys, and the spleen. And fortunately, there's enough data on this subject now to um, result in actually a number of meta-analyses and systemic reviews, systematic reviews, excuse me. Uh, and I think before we really jump into the studies covered by those, uh, those papers, it's important to delineate what topics are not covered by existing studies on this subject. Uh, and to start with, there are no studies looking specifically at penetrating solid organ injuries, either managed operatively or non-operatively. And furthermore, there are no studies looking specifically at trauma patients with blunt solid organ injuries that are managed operatively. So the bulk of this literature is comprised of blunt solid organ injuries managed non-operatively. And although there is a AASD-sponsored prospective multicenter study in progress on this topic, most of the existing literature is retrospective single-center work. Here are two of the sort of more solid papers on this subject. If you're interested in pursuing the primary literature, I'd recommend these as a good place to start. But basically, these studies all suggest that once the patients are no longer showing clinical signs of bleeding, that VTE prophylaxis can safely be initiated within 48 hours of ED arrival. And at that point, it's safe and effective. By safe, we mean that it does not increase the failure rate of non-operative management, and furthermore, does not increase the need for post-prophylaxis blood transfusion. And these are really sort of two ways to quantify clinically significant bleeding, because although it is a bit tempting to look at drifting hemoglobins, for example, uh, because that, that really sort of doesn't result in anything tangible to your patient, we only care about bleeding if it results in a clinical change for our patients. Uh, and in addition to that, safety is also effective and reduces VTEs, both DVTs and PEs. In terms of the limitations of the existing literature, there's underrepresentation of very high-grade injuries, and I think that's probably because these injuries are more likely to be managed operatively. Uh, there's also underrepresentation of combined injuries, and therefore, if you're faced with these patients clinically, I think we just need to remember that we're extrapolating existing data to a slightly different study population. Uh, how to manage concomitant TBIs in this literature, I think, is one of the biggest challenges. Um, this is a very important confounder as we look at VT prophylaxis after blunt solid organ injury. Uh, head injuries are a common reason for VT prophylaxis to be delayed, uh, but they're also an important risk factor for VT. So in a lot of different ways, the, so the presence of an associated head injury really does sort of complicate the picture with these solid organ injuries. And for that reason, of the existing literature, about 50% of those studies exclude associated TBIs uh, from the, the inclusion criteria. Uh, and I think really, as we do that, we're sort of trading scientific integrity for clinical relevance with these patient populations. And what I mean by that is there's no question that exclusion of this group of important confounders certainly gives you a more statistically robust or rigorous study population. But because these injuries are so commonly associated, I think it does diminish some of the, the clinical relevance uh, in terms of the patients you see in front of you as you compare them to the literature. And lastly, especially as we sort of uh, accumulate these data together into the meta-analyses, there is heterogeneity in the definitions of important outcomes, which really makes it challenging to pool the results of these studies and consider them together. One of the important ones is failure of non-operative management. So most of the studies define this simply as the need for laparotomy at some interval of time after admission. And more than six hours was the most common time cutoff for that. We actually just wrote a review paper on this, um, on this subject and advocated for the use of that as the definition moving forward to help improve um, consistency between these studies. 
Furthermore, some of the studies used the use of angioembolization to help define failure of non-operative management, which I think is counterintuitive and, and not really helpful. Angioembolization has been touted as one of the, the primary reasons that the rates of successful non-operative management after blunt solid organ injury are so high. Uh, so I think it, it gets a bit backwards to start talking about that as uh, uh, part of the definition of failure of non-operative management. And furthermore, delayed use of angioembolization is often undertaken to manage a pseudoaneurysm and not for bleeding. So in that way, this is another way that um, really these patients should not be considered to have failed non-operative management. Next, some of these studies use angioembolization as part of their definition of operative intervention, which for all the same reasons I think is counterintuitive and these patients should be considered non-operative patients. Uh, and then finally, the definitions of what specifically constitutes early prophylaxis varies a fair bit. Usually uh, within the time frame of less than 24 to 72 hours after admission, sometimes after injury, but less than 48 hours was most common and I, I do think is the most sort of scientific. There's some basic science literature, especially TEG-based studies, that suggest that trauma patients transition from a hypo to hypercoagulable state around that time frame. So I think sort of scientifically that, that time cutoff uh, is intuitive. And it's interesting, I think, you know, over the past few years, I think 48 hours has actually started to seem quite late. I think if you think about your clinical practice, most of us start prophylaxis, you know, the morning after admission, for example. So I think moving forward, we're likely to see studies looking more at less than 24 hours as the cutoff. And then other final considerations, uh, the optimal agent, dose, and the need for monitoring. Uh, although there are no studies looking specifically at this topic among blunt solid organ injuries, there is a lot of literature looking at the choice of agent among trauma patients in general. And I think, uh, you know, in 2022, there's really no question that low molecular weight heparin is a superior agent to unfractionated heparin for VT chemoprophylaxis after trauma. Uh, this study demonstrated that it decreases mortality and is associated with a reduction in VTE. Uh, this excellent set of guidelines published by the Western Trauma Association and authored by actually several people in this room um, looked at this question further and specifically looked at the choice of agent and the need for monitoring, so we'll go through that. They concurred that these solid organ injuries are moderate to high-risk patients worthy of sort of specific consideration. And what these authors said was that once the patient is not bleeding, that you can initiate VT prophylaxis safely within 24 hours. From there, they advocate to give most patients low molecular weight heparin at a dose of 40 milligrams every 12 hours. And I think this is a little bit controversial. Many centers still use 30 milligrams Q12 as their default, but this recommendation was made on the basis that of literature demonstrating that many patients are underdosed with that dosing regimen. And then lastly, they advocate to consider monitoring with anti 10 a levels um, on the basis of science that shows that lowers VTE rates without increasing bleeding. So to bring that all together, uh, it suggests initiating VT prophylaxis early after blunt solid organ injuries, and by early I mean less than 48 hours, although less than 24 hours may be more appropriate as we move forward. Uh, low molecular weight heparin is the agent of choice, although the specific dose and the need for monitoring still remains controversial. And then lastly, just know that apart from blunt solid organ injuries managed non-operatively, the other solid organ injury subsets have not been specifically examined, so we are extrapolating data and we just need to take a bit of caution in our clinical practices as we do so. Thank you.